the students will come in. Okay, um, Shinamase, please go ahead. Uh, Teresa is there. Hello, sir. Am I audible? Uh, yeah, yes, of course. Please go ahead. If the future is to remain open and free, we need people who can tolerate the unknown, who will not need the support of completely worked out systems or traditional blueprints from the past. Keeping that in mind, opportunities don't always come by. And during this novel pandemic situation, it's even more scarce. But I thank Almighty God for keeping us safe and giving us the opportunity to conduct this webinar. On behalf of the Department of English, under the leadership of Mr. Sijo Joseph Chenelil, the head of the department, and Reverend Father Joshi Chirankuri CMI, the principal of KCMT. I, Firza Sabir. And I, Teresa Thomas. Of third year B English, together welcome you all to the webinar titled, The Aesthetics of Rupture Reading Literature. Before we begin, let's take a moment of silence. I request the participants to take note of a few guidelines for the smooth conduct of the webinar. I request the participants to mute the audio to avoid any kind of disturbances. I also request the participants not to post anything in the chat box unless you have a question to raise. All the questions that are intended for the Q&A session are to be posted in the chat box. A feedback form will be posted in the chat box at the end of the webinar where an e-certificate will be mailed to you upon its completion. Now, I invite Ms. Teresa Thomas of Third Year B English for the welcome speech. Good afternoon to each one of you present to this webinar. I'm truly honored to welcome all of you to be an integral part of this webinar. Firstly, our dear principal, Reverend Father Joshi Chirangri CMI, who with his excellent managerial skills is rightly the pillar of this institution. I welcome you, dear father, to this webinar. Honorable Dr. C.B. James, Associate Professor, Department of English at St. Thomas College, Pala, is our resource person for this wonderful evening. Today's webinar on the aesthetics rupture leading literature would help us to gain various perspectives of aesthetics and understand literature deeper. Arachori will enlighten us further of Professor C.B. James's excellence in academics and his contributions to the literary arena. We are extremely grateful for your valuable time that we get to share with you, sir. I welcome you, sir, to this webinar and wish you all the very best. Mr. Sejo Joseph Chenelil, head of the English department, is an individual who needs no introduction. His guidelines, helps us as well as the department to reach successful heights. I welcome you, sir, to this webinar. Thank you. And our sincere gratitude to Ms. Sheena Susan Baby, ma'am, who generously helped us in making this event become a reality. I also heartily welcome all the teachers of our department. I also welcome all the KCMT English department students and everyone joining in now. I welcome all of you once again and hope that you will have a fruitful session. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Mr. Sejo Joseph Chenelil, the head and heart of the English department, whose faith in people to do better in life is truly an inspiration. We are always grateful for his inspiring leadership. Now, I invite Mr. Sejo Joseph Chenelil for the felicitation and to introduce today's resource person. Good afternoon to all of you, each and every one of you. Um, Reverend Father Joshi Chirangri CMI, the principal of the college, he's absent here. His plate is always full, so he does have a hectic or busy schedule, so he's not here. But I acknowledge the, the, the step, stellar and the outstanding uh, support he has been extending uh, for the total uh, good of uh, our uh, department. And also, um, all the English teachers, uh, Shina Miss, uh, uh, Nisha Miss, uh, Nisi Miss, and other, uh, all other teachers of the English department. Uh, and they have also been working really hard for the betterment and upgradation of uh, 
especially uh, upgradation of our department. Uh, and plus uh, all the students who have uh, worked really hard uh, to bring this particular webinar into, into fruition. So now I would like to uh, get into the, uh, the process of introducing uh, Dr. C.B. James as sir. Uh, Dr. C.B. James, uh, Associate Professor, Department of English, St. Thomas College, Palais, is an uh, academically attuned personality having a colossal mastery over English language and literature. His proficiency over his mother tongue is profound and so discernible. Quite simply put it, I admired this immense personality in my college days. But we never crossed paths. Although once uh, one of my friends pointed out his uh, harm to me, a look at that marvelous structure, gave me a clear cut idea about the creativity in it, in uh, dear uh, Dr. C.B. James sir. I need to tell you that it was um, the, the house was uh, our house is in the model of a, a bird's uh, nest. I think you, I think anybody would uh, I mean anybody who sees that would marvel at the, the beauty in which the the uh, I think the article architectural magnificence, uh, magnificence magnificence of that particular structure. Um, and I need to stress that um, I was uh, uh, taught by his father, and I fondly recollect uh, now his uh, uh, father, dear Chakosa. As the classes I attended, uh, which were simply uh, remarkable and outstanding. I must tell you, I, I even uh, right now recollect uh, the Resolution of Independence uh, poem written by William Birdsworth that he took uh, for us uh, first year degree students. Okay, the words uh, flowed out uh, of his heart uh, like a melodious song, marooning, inundating, and submerging all of us. Maybe uh, he only instilled and inculcated uh, my interest towards English language. Eternally indebted and grateful to that great human being, great personality. And I must tell you, he always uh, uh, spoke from his heart. Uh, and he always uh, spoke uh, English and language with clarity and lucidity. And I must tell you, I have never come across a person, a person um, who handled English like him uh, in my life, uh, uh, except maybe uh, we see uh, Harris, Dr. V. C. Harris. Uh, uh, by whom I was taught. So I, I was a student of him as well, and the later uh, we see Harris. Um, and um, especially about uh, uh, C.B. James, sir, he has been an inspiration to many college students uh, through his uh, devotion, dedication, and uh, commitment to his profession of teaching. His accomplishments in the academic arena are in depth, unprecedented, and unparalleled. His ability to delve deep into the intricacies of literature is quite astonishing. Even the topic titled the Aesthetics of Rapture, reading literature, which is the topic of this webinar, is weighed down with full of meanings, such as, uh, uh, such as the re-encounter with the literature, re-reading of literary works from different perspectives and angles, and deconstructive wavelength of literature. We are so honored to have you, Sarah, as the resource person of this webinar. Now over to you uh, uh, for, uh, or over to you, sir, dear sir, for your enlightening section. Please take over from here, sir, with him, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, Jody of the Department, for your warm words. And thank you more for remembering my father, who taught you long back. Actually, this is a blessing of being a teacher's son. When uh, I go to places to talk, or maybe even simply when I meet people, they always talk about my father. And I'm very happy that I'm my father's son. So uh, the introduction was in a way overwhelming. And I am happy about that. Now, uh, before I start, I must tell you something. Uh, your anchor at the beginning, she said, if you have questions, you can post it in the chat box. Please don't do that. Because, you know, uh, I have got quite wonderful eyes and it's not easy for me to read the screen. I just manage things when the pandemic came and when we were all forced to become, uh, in a way, slaves of technology. Otherwise, I was practicing a kind of 
uh, fasting technology, digital fasting can call it. I never wanted to use electronic gadgets. So I was keeping myself away from the modern world and I was very happy with being a primitive human being. But suddenly the uh, pandemic came and the compulsions, they made me uh, learn everything. So I'm a novice in uh, using gadgets. So I won't be able to read your questions and answer them. So if you have questions, please ask them. Uh, I don't mind being interrupted because in a way I'm a seasoned person as far as speaking is concerned. I can speak on and I don't mind being interrupted. So if someone has a question, uh, maybe he can ask in the uh, course of the talk or uh, you know, if you feel like after the end of the talk, also you're free to raise questions if, if there's not necessarily questions, responses or mm -hmm. any kind of thing that you feel like saying. So don't hesitate. You can make it lively by uh, instead of making it a kind of monologic discourse. It cannot be discourse, it's a monologue. So make it a discourse. The discursive pattern can be maintained if you want. Even the teachers, if they want to intervene or even stop uh, when I go on, so you're free. I'm telling the truth because you know I'm not a person uh, crafted for technology. That is one happy thing for me. But when other people look at me, it's a sad thing. So you know when I go for seminars, uh, people ask me uh, what kind of arrangements should be made, PowerPoint, this and that. I tell them I have only two PowerPoints. They are my fingertips. You know I can point with my fingers more than that. So these are the PowerPoints for me. So uh, don't worry, uh, that is not a handicap as far as I am concerned. Anyway, when I think about myself. Uh, now, coming to what we are supposed to uh, talk, what I am supposed to talk. Uh, actually, I, I hope you had a session in the morning by Professor Tomi Chalian, when Professor Tomi Chalian uh, contacted me when we were supposed to be the speakers for the day. Uh, he told me he had a small chat over the phone and he said he would handle the language part and reserve the literature part for me. I said, okay, I don't mind. So any kind of convenient divisions can be made. And that was our agreement. I don't know what he spoke, but I know uh, he's my teacher. Uh, just like uh, Sijo sir remembered his teacher, you know, Tommy Charian sir, was the first person to come to my class, my BA class, when I started my BA in 1987. He came to my class as the first teacher. So you can see a kind of uh, continuum in the whole process of uh, pedagogical exercise. He was my teacher and he gave me a kind of passion for knowledge, not only for literature, actually, he was well-versed in areas like painting, because we were having a wonderful collection of essays those days by William Hazlitt, the romantic essays, essayist. Uh, actually, we had to study 12 essays by Hazlitt in the first year. And Hazlitt is a very tough writer with plenty of allusions to sculpture, paintings, music, and literary works. Actually, when I look at it from a point of time, so uh, remote from that point, so uh, advanced, because this is 2021. Uh, I wonder how that text was taught by him and how we learned that text, because it is quite tough for a first year BA student to learn the essays of Hazlitt and not one essay or two, 12 essays by Hazlitt. Uh, those were the times. And uh, he instilled in us uh, knowledge regarding plenty of European painters you know, the kind of visual aesthetics, uh, knowledge regarding famous musicians. And he was having an avid passion for films, those days. He had attended a uh, program, uh, some, kind of an, uh, some kind of a film appreciation program at Pune Film Institute. And he showered all his passion for films on us. And we were the people who gained uh, from all those things, uh, talking about all those classics in the film dump. So those were wonderful days. And I'm happy that the uh, speaker in the morning was Professor Tomi Chalian. And uh, now uh, I'm going to 
come to my topic. I just gave a title. When somebody asks you to give a title for a seminar or topic, webinar, whatever it is, you must give a topic. So I gave a topic. That is the aesthetics of rapture. And as Sijos said, it's a title which is pregnant with semantic significance. Plenty of layers of meaning could be attributed to that, but uh, don't worry about the layers of meaning. We shall try to make it plain because my strategy is not to make things complex. Whenever I take a class, my attempt is always at making things very simple because uh, that is my fundamental philosophy. There is no need to make life complex. Life, uh, if you take it in a very simple way, it's a simple thing. You can be happy about life. But, you know, people make it complex, unnecessary, uh, because of so many things. You know, yesterday, you know what happened in Pali, day before uh, Actually, there is a coincidence. Uh, my topic had nothing to do with what I'm trying, uh, what I'm telling you now. When I gave the topic, or till uh, 11.30, on 1st October, uh, my topic had nothing to do with what I tell you now. But you know, this is evolution. My mind underwent a sudden cataclysmic change. I was taking a, a class that was on DS Elite, the wasteland. And that was in our staff quarters because the online pattern is still on. From tomorrow, I'll meet my PG students offline in class. But uh, till now, it was in the online pattern. So I was holding a class and in that class I was telling my students about the eternal victimization of the female. Remember one of the most important themes in the wasteland. I was doing the Madam Sosostris fragment in the wasteland, the fifth fragment and I teach the text I divide it into compartments for ease of understanding. So I was talking about the Madam Sosostris fragment and I was talking about the way in which actually aggression, violence, all these things are unleashed on femininity, how the woman becomes a perennial victim. Now, when I was uh, making this, uh, these statements, when I was talk, teaching my students, I did not know that just 25 meters away, Aerial distance is around 24 or 30 meters from where I was sitting. But I had my room closed because I did not want any disturbance from outside. So I had my room closed and, uh, you know, something extremely gruesome was happening. The same thing, aggression on a human body. Aggression on, you know, this is what is rupture, you can say. Rupture is fragmentation, breaking, you know it? Life is cut off. There's a kind of uh, rupture in the continuum called life. And, uh, you know, I completed my class, I opened my window, and I saw that the entire campus was filled with, when I started my class at 10.30, nothing was wrong with the world. Everything was perfect. But uh, at 11.30 or just after that, when I opened my window, what I see is that the campus is filled with uh, police uh, vehicles, cameramen, plenty of people. Actually, the gate was blocked, but there were plenty of people inside. And I rushed to the scene and the rest of it, you know. But that didn't stop there because immediately after that, because I'm a senior teacher uh, in my college and I've got uh, plenty of responsibilities, I had to do a lot of things after that in connection with this. Yesterday also, because uh, I, I'm part of the internal complaints committee, we had to hold an online meeting to discuss the whole thing, what is to be done after this. I had to go to the uh, place where the funeral was held. So suddenly, life became extremely complex. Now, what I'm telling you is it becomes complex because of one person's activity, isn't it? An activity which you call in Malayalam, Actually, that's a Sanskrit word, akrama. Akrama. You look at the word. Actually, uh, a slight bit of introduction was given by your HOD. Uh, my passion is actually for Malaya. You know, even though I'm a teacher of uh, English, I later on diverted my study entirely to Malayalam. My PhD is on Manipravalam uh, literature, not properly literature. Manipravalam is a mixture of Malayalam and Sanskrit. So I made a new historicist study of 
the Manipravalam period in Kerala history based on temple paintings, architecture and everything. And the topic is definitely about the human body. Remember, human body, the way in which uh, the body is depicted in painting, in architecture, in Kerala. Now, you do not know that Kerala had a history of homoerotic bonding, homosexuality. Now, we talk a lot about this and that. We talk about our own ancient cultural tradition. But actually, in Kerala, visual representation, you can see homosexuality openly presented. So I was making a kind of study based on new historicist theory on the human body and its representations, particularly the representation of uh, the concept of the feminine in uh, the Kerala art of that time some uh, seven centuries back around that period from 13th century to 15th century hence common era so you know the way in which you look at the concept of akrama violence you know there's a it's a perennial thing it's a perennial thing and this is what you transmute into art isn't it and i'm, I'm telling you this thing because even, this, even if this incident had not taken place, uh, my talk would have gone into uh, aggression on human bodies in different forms, sexual aggressions uh, in the form of wars, riots, or any other kind of power imposed on one body by another body, whether it is colonialism or uh, some kind of social structure. We see all around us in neighboring countries everywhere how certain individuals or certain communities impose power physically, psychically, emotionally on other bodies. So this is something that happens everywhere. This is what you call life. This is life in a way. Actually, this should not be life. I tell you once again, there was no need for making life this kind of a complex thing. There's no need for making life. is a very simple thing. Actually, even your so-called innocent games are teaching you to be aggressive, isn't it? You listened to the person who committed that murder. He was a Panchakusti champion, arm wrestling. Now, when you are a Panchakusti champion, your primary aim is to physically overpower the other person. And you do it. So what I'm telling you is, uh, my primary interest in Malayalam literature and allied with that, I was compelled to learn Sanskrit. I'm not a Sanskrit scholar or anything, but uh, I was compelled to learn some Sanskrit because Malayalam, I took a PG in Malayalam uh, after my uh, you know, PG in English. And I uh, went for the UGC JRF in Malayalam. My research topic is purely related to Malayalam, even though my PhD is in English. PhD is in English, but the topic is Malayalam. So uh, those things took me to certain things which uh, actually, we are not aware of the way in which the human body is depicted, the way in which violence is depicted, the way in which sexual aggression is depicted, plenty of things. So I use the word akrama. It's a Sanskrit word, but when you use it in Malayalam, you know it is violence, aggression. But what is akrama? Akrama is something that is out of the normal, isn't it? Krama is regular something that goes in the usual pattern. Akrama is something that is abnormal, not something quite normal. So when some kind of a physical violence like this happens, you call it Akrama, because this is not something that happens every day. Uh, I have been in that campus for uh, so many years. I started my BA there, uh, that was in 87. So it is almost 34 years now, more than 34 years, my association with that campus. In the meantime, I went for uh, my higher studies. Some years I was not there, but my contact with St. Thomas is uh, almost three and a half decades. And the college has a history of 70 years, which means almost half of its life I was with the college. But this never happened. This is something that happens for the first time. And this first time is what makes it Akrama, isn't it? That is something that is uh, abnormal, something out of the norm. So this is what happens in life unnecessarily we are making things very complex. Suddenly the, the flow of life is ruptured. Otherwise, our campus was having a very smooth life. Everything was going on perfectly well. I was teaching quite comfortably in my room. But suddenly there's a rupture. 
there's a break. That is called bhanga. Break is bhanga. And you know the word bhangi. You know, bhangi. In uh, Malayalam, usually we mispronounce words like bhangi. Or for people around court time and all, sometimes we go fangi. Isn't it? Because we are not quite conscious of even Malayalam pronunciation. So we say fangi. Alla fangi alla al. Fangi alla sambho. Alla. But it is bhangi. Ga. Ga is pronounced because it is a Sanskrit word. Uh, I don't know whether you listen to good poetry recitation. Poetry is to be read with the ears. No. Gerard Manley Hopkins, the great Welsh poet. Actually, he's not a Welsh poet, but he was writing from Wales. So we can call him a Welsh poet. So Hopkins told us poetry is to be read with the ears, not with the eyes. Don't read poetry with the eyes. So sound patterns are very important. So try to recite poems. Try to listen to good recitations, not necessarily English. Listen to Malayalam recitations because that will also teach you what poetry is. There's a beautiful recitation of Kairuna by Kumar Nasha. That is uh, by Matasudan and Nair. So Nair himself is a poet and he recites poems well. He recites his own poems and he recites the poems of other people. And Kairuna has been beautifully recited by Kumar Nasha. That's available. You can even, I, I think you can get it from the net if you want. So at one point in the poem, uh, he recites that that particular uh, segment like this. Pasura nakshatram pole pangil vidar niruna kesara mukula mundo gandhamela de Pasura nakshatram pole pangil vidar niruna. Pangi is the word. So pangi uh, is rapture. You know, we translate it into English as beauty, pangi, something that is beautiful. But the word actually has its root in this. Fisher, F-I-S-S-U-R, fisher, rupture, break. So out of some kind of a break is beauty born. Aesthetics is the science of beauty. Lavanya Shastra, isn't it? Lavanya Shastra. So the science of beauty we are all trying to become esthetes, people who are having capacity to appreciate beauty. But the concept of beauty has to be defined first. Beauty requires a concept, isn't it? What is beauty? That is what every student of literature, every student of art, every student of cinema, visual media, whatever it is, we are all trying to grapple with the fundamental question, what is beauty? And if you get an answer to what is beauty, then you can represent beauty, you can create beauty, everything. So I am talking about some fundamental concepts. That doesn't mean that this is the only thing about beauty. There are plenty of theories regarding beauty. Greek philosophy, even before Plato, even before Socrates, pre-Socratic philosophers, you call them pre-Socratic, even before Socrates, uh, philosophers like Heraclitus or Parmenides, plenty of them. They had all talked about beauty and uh, the way in which the human mind perceives beauty. The Indian philosophic system, actually I had the good fortune to uh, three, uh, do three uh, courses in Indian philosophy, Indian aesthetics and Indian grammatical tradition during my postgraduate days. I had a wonderful teacher by name Dr. Kapil Kapoor. He is still there and I, I occasionally meet him in some webinars. He's very old now, uh, Dr. Kabil Kapoor. And uh, he doesn't give too many lectures, but occasionally I uh, happen to meet him in certain webinars even now. So uh, he taught us all these things, these uh, concepts relating to Indian aesthetics. Uh, I'm not going to make a long, uh, profound, talk on Indian aesthetics either. But I'll just give you some fundamental concepts. Only I have given you one, that is the concept of bhangi. You require a rapture to make something beautiful. That is why tragedy is the most appealing form of literature. You know, when we uh, used to stage uh, Shakespeare plays long back during the days of the annual system, now it's the semester system, uh, the good old days when the university had the annual system. 
in our college, we used to stage full-length Shakespeare plays. I have done. I was the protagonist in these performances. I have done the chief role in uh, Macbeth, uh, King Lear, Othello, The Merchant of Venice, and I wanted to do Hamlet. Actually, every two years we used to stage one Shakespeare play. One year is required for the rehearsal and staging and everything of one Shakespeare drama because when we staged it, it takes almost five hours for the total staging. It's so long. I wanted to do Hamlet, but the year when we were planning to, in 2001, we did our last play. That is also look. Hamlet should have happened in 2003, but in 2002, the university introduced the semester system. So Hamlet still remains a tragedy for me. I have not performed Hamlet. So literally, it's a tragedy I wanted to. I've been teaching Hamlet, but I haven't staged Hamlet. So uh, it's a personal tragedy that I couldn't do that because in the semester system, you can't manage to stage a full-length Shakespeare play. It's not possible. Uh, the exams, you don't know when the exams will come. You don't get enough working days. You don't get time for rehearsals. So that did not happen. But what I'm trying to tell you is, when you think about staging a play, immediately the notion that comes to your mind is that let us stage a tragedy. Because a comedy will not be appealing to the audience. Merchant of Venice is not a proper tragedy. It's a tragic comedy. But even then, it has got elements of tragedy in it. Uh, it's a powerful play, so it could be staged. But compared to Macbeth or King Lear or Othello or Hamlet, the other plays will not be successful. So tragedy will succeed on stage because it creates this kind of uh, bunga, a rupture in your heart. It is something dealing with death. Because, you know, death is a rupture of life, isn't it? Death is a rupture of life. Suddenly, life gets broken. And death is something when represented in art. I'm talking about art. But, well, there's a world of difference between life and art. You know, when something happens in life, it is really, uh, you know, the word that I used, gruesome. Something that appalls you. Something that shocks you to the core. A chill down the spine, you can call it. It's the same thing. When you transmute it into art, when you're witnessing it, definitely all these things are there. The chill down the spine experience is definitely there. When you watch a tragedy or a, a, a wonderful film with tragic elements in it, or horror elements in it, whatever the kind of film be, but after the performance, you know, once the film is over, or once you read a, a text that is dealing with extremely uh, horrifying incidents, you're watching a film with such a thing. Now, after the incident, what you say is not that the whole thing was horrible, the whole thing was bad. You say you watched a good film. You read a good novel. You read a good, uh, you know, you watched a good play. Hamlet is a wonderful tragedy, you say. So that there's a world of difference between life and art, isn't it? Something that is unbearable in life, when it becomes the subject matter of art, it becomes a subject of aesthetics. The same rupture in life renders beauty in art. Now there's something called aesthetics of violence. If you watch films by Quentin Tarantino and all, you can classify them under the, the title Aesthetics of Violence. You watch films relating to the Holocaust. You know, the, Hitler, uh, the, the Holocaust experience of Hitler. That was absolutely unimaginable, isn't it? Killing so many people in uh, unthinkable ways. Actually, people say that science, particularly medical science, had the greatest progress during Hitler's time because Hitler was supplying live human bodies for any kind of experimentation. Now you conduct experiments. He was asking his German doctors, now suppose you want to uh, test a very dangerous drug. Here is a live human being. A Jew is there. You test it on him. Suppose you want to make experiments regarding the impact of pressure on a human body. You put him in a small vacuum chamber. 
then increase the pressure. At which point will he start wriggling? At, at what point will his uh, internal organs stop functioning? At what pressure will he die? Or reduce the pressure? You know, suck air from the uh, chamber. And at what point will his ears start bleeding? At what point will his, uh, you know, nose start bleeding? You can make experiments, live experiments on human bodies. So Hitler was supplying bodies and medical science advanced a lot. Thanks to Hitler. Is it a good thing? But when the same thing is presented in art, it becomes an object of pleasure for us. It becomes an object of pleasure. Actually, we must say we enjoy that. We enjoy that. The negative side of this is that people start imitating. And when you watch a gruesome thing on screen, you know visuals have tremendous impact on us. So there's always a tendency to be mimetic, to be imitative regarding these things. That is the negative side of that. But generally, theories of art will tell you that art should not motivate. Art should not lead you to action. Art is for contemplation, not for action. Unfortunately, that is not what is happening always. Art is sometimes at least leading people to action also. And those actions are dangerous also. So, you know, in, 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 a, in, a, in a play, actually the play is wonderful. It is called Hitler Dances. Hitler Dances by Howard Brent. It's a very powerful uh, late 20th century drama in which uh, there is a kind of description of cutting the enemy's throat with a small blade. The enemy's vein, jugular, jugular vein, with a small, uh, you know, swish of a blade, you can kill a person. Hitler was teaching the soldiers to apply this on his enemies. And Howard Brenton is using this particular kind of training session for this play. And, you know, that is the way in which things which are extremely horrible in life become objects of aesthetic pleasure. You call it aesthetic bliss, aesthetic rapture. The word that I used in my title is rapture. The opposite of this is rapture. Rapture, aesthetic bliss. Something that uh, gives you a kind of holistic experience. Rapture is a kind of anand. In Indian aesthetics, you use the word rasananda. Rasananda. Aesthetic rapture. So from rapture to rapture, you can see whatever is absolutely horrible in human life becomes a thing of rapture in art. You go back to the Mahabharata. The greatest, greatest example is the Mahabharata. Because there is a very powerful sloka regarding the Mahabharata. Whenever you say Mahabharata, you must say the Mahabharata. The definite article is a must when you talk about an epic, the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, the Iliad, the Odyssey. So, uh, the Mahabharata, there's a sloka, a quatrain, yadi hasti, tadanyatra, yane hasti, natat kwachit. Whatever you see in this may be found elsewhere. Whatever you don't see in this will not be found anywhere else. Yadi hasti, tadanyatra, yane hasti, natat kwachit. No, it's not at all plain. I have been teaching the Mahabharata for a long time in my PG classes. And I can vouch for this. Now, you can ask a silly question like, is the mobile phone in the Mahabharata? That is not the implication of the statement. Because in T.S. Eliot's tradition and the individual talent, it's a fabulous critical essay. Eliot says at one point, life never progresses. Life only gets complicated over time. Life gets complicated over time. Life never progresses. And this is absolutely true. Because, you know, when uh, time goes by, life is becoming more and more complex, no doubt. 
I hope Sijosa is slightly junior to me by age, but I think we belong to the same generation. If he recollects his childhood, and I can recollect because I live in a, a small village, a remote village, which is becoming a non-village now because the village quality, the rusticity of even my place is slowly getting eroded because of uh, the impact of modernization, urbanization, and so many other isations. But when I was a young person, we had no electricity. Electricity came to my house only after I, I completed my pre degree, that is, the present higher secondary. That was when electricity came to my house. I don't know whether you'll believe in that. A telephone came to my house only after I got a job. So uh, the thing is that those were primitive times, isn't it? Life was, as I said, very simple. We had no complaints, actually. Now, without electricity, I never felt that it was. Uh, horrible life or a bad life. But now, when there's a power failure, I can't bear it for five minutes. Look at this, the way in which the whole thing changes. Life becomes complicated. A person who lived till his 25th year without even a telephone can't live without a mobile phone for two minutes. So life becomes complicated. And naturally, whatever this complication entails will be there. This is what Elliot says. But can you call it progress? That's what Elias says. Life never progresses. It gets complicated over time. This is what Elias says. And I think this is absolutely true because if you read the Vedas or the Upanishads, there is a very profound kind of wisdom regarding human existence. You won't find anything more profound than those things in our modern readings. Human beings could think about life in extremely philosophical terms, those days. When I teach the Brihad Aranika Upanishad, towards the end of the wasteland, Brihad Aranika means the big forest, the big forest. There's a celebration of nature. You know, there's nothing more theoretical than the Brihad Aranika Upanishad in the latest eco criticism textbook or green studies reader. Plenty of green studies readers are there, eco-criticism readers are there. You can get plenty of theories regarding uh, the conserving of nature or preservation of natural things or fights against pollution. But you won't find it as powerful as the Brihad Aranika Upanishad. So the fundamental concept, even the concept of teaching, the Upanishad means set beside the Shishya sits by the side of the Guru. And there is a straight kind of learning from the Guru to the Shishya. Can you supplant or substitute that with any kind of modern gadget? Now I'm speaking to a small tablet in front of me. And if you are listening to my voice using those instruments. Definitely plenty of things have changed. But can you say that I am more advanced than the people who composed the Upanishads or people who, who had the mode of teaching and learning of the Upanishadic times. The journey, the quest, what do you call quest? The quest is the greatest archetype, the prarubha, the most primordial form of knowledge. That's what I call archetype. The quest is the most important archetype because we are all questers after knowledge. We want to learn more and more. But where is our, our journey taking us to? Our journey is taking us to the borders of ignorance. The borders of ignorance. In Ovi Vijayan, Ovi Vijayan is the most philosophical novelist in Malayana. I admire Vijayan more than any other novelist. There are plenty of novelists who got uh, great prizes like Nyan Pete, including M.T. Vasudev Nair. M.T. is a very good novelist. But when you come to the depth of philosophy, MT will come nowhere near Ovi Vijayan. Ovi Vijayan's uh, novels like Guru Sagaram, Pravachakandamari, Talamuragal, and all the other ones. Six novels are there altogether. From Kasakani Dihasam to Talamuragal. So, that's not a great output you can say. Six novels. Only. But when you come to the kind of philosophical depth, even global, globally acclaimed writers, will not come anywhere near Vijayan. That's what I say. Vijayan is a grossly underrated 
uh, novelist when it comes to his international reputation. Vijayan's works got translated into English, but maybe people did not see the kind of profundity that is there in Vijayan's writings. I have read a lot of literary works because, in a way, I have no other passions except teaching and reading. So I have read uh, works from plenty of languages. I have never come across a better writer than Vijayan. That's my personal experience. And at one point in Pravachakan Tamayi, Vijayan says, Nakshatrangla Kurche, Vidhi Arayinu Dil Kudil Onnu, Buddhimani Marayin Illa. Nakshatrangla Kurche, Vidhi Arayinu Dil Kudil Onnu, Buddhimani Marayin Illa. Look at this, the philosophy behind the statement. You know, we think the, the scientists, astrophysics or whatever it is, they think they know a lot about the stars. What do they know? And what's the purpose of that knowledge? Whether they know or not, has it given us any amount of information regarding the meaning of human existence? The telos, we call it teleology, the purpose of existence. What is the purpose of existence? Why do you exist? Whether you know everything about the stars or not, this knowledge, as long as you don't have this knowledge, life is a zero, a cipher. I think it is in Aram uh, Tambura, the film Mohanlal Star, where he tells us, who am I? If you don't answer this question, if you don't have an answer to this question, my name is not, not me, is it? C.B. James, what has that name got with me? When uh, I was a child, I used to quarrel with my father. Why did, he give, uh, why did he give me this name? I don't like this name. And my father said, I gave you uh, the name of a great mythical king, a sacrificial king called Shibi, Shibi Maharaja. I told him, whatever it is, mythical king or not, Actually, I should have been given a more masculine name. I, I thought my name was a feminine name. Anyway, now I, I don't have any complaints about my name because I have learned to live with my name. And anyway, as my father told me, it's a name of a great sacrificial king. But when I went to uh, Delhi, I had a small need for a medical x-ray. And I... Uh, Went to the hospital, I took the x-ray, and when the x-ray came to me, on the cover of the x-ray, it was written, name, CB James, sex, question mark. That was what was inscribed on that. Because the uh, person there in Delhi, he was not familiar with this name. And the person who took the x-ray, the uh, person who gave me the cover, he did not know whether this was of a male or a female, so there's a question mark there. So even my gender is a question mark. So what I'm telling you is, a name does not have anything to do with a person. The existence of the name, technical name is the existent. I am an existent, an existing B, E-X-I-S-T-E-N-T. But my language that I am Amalia, my name, whatever it is, my all, all my identities, they don't designate the fundamental existent that I am. So as long as I do not know anything about this being, what is the point in learning about all these things? So this is a basic thing. So that is what Eliot said, knowledge. So uh, I was talking about the Mahabharata. When you go to the Mahabharata, you see that whatever is there could be elsewhere. Whatever is not there cannot be found anywhere else. So that no, that that epic, it is about human predicament, isn't it? The result of human aggression. You know about the Battle of Kurukshetra. 18 Akshauhinis went out into the battlefields. 18 Akshauhinis. Lacks of people. How many survived? Just 18 days of war. 18 Akshauhinis. 18 days of war. After 18 days, only 10 people survived. Only 10 people survived. Everyone else perished on the battlefields. 
this is what you call aggression this is what you call violence the magnitude of that but when that became a great epic it embodies everything isn't it whatever can be imagined regarding human affairs lust jealousy rivalry uh, kind of power mongery whatever can be imagined regarding human relationships everything is there and you remember was there a female who went out into battle there in the mahabharata no only males so absolutely male enterprise isn't it a war is a male enterprise most aggressions are male enterprises this is not this is not to exonerate women in total but from time immemorial aggression has been greatly reserved by the masculine fraction of the society whether there is anything biological about that or is it a culturally produced kind of thing that should be properly ascertained but this is a fact so the mahabharata is talking about extremely unbearable occurrences extremely negative examples negative examples remember drona chari now we give a drona chari award to the sports coaches professor sunny thomas the olympian shooting coach who was a fellow teacher of english he was a teacher of the generation of my father but when i was I, when i joined service he was still in service and i have gone to old st stephen's college as a speaker because he invited me for a speech there when i was a young teacher so professor sunny thomas got a dronacharya award but actually it is a misnomer a wrong name you can say because if you read the mahabharata carefully you will see that veda vyasa the author who was veda vyasa uh, is there a real person called veda vyasa or is the mahabharata a compilation of uh, things written by many people such debates are but we forget that uh, we accept that veda vyasa is the writer and vyasa presents people like dronacharya as examples of people whom you should not imitate Now he is not an acharya if you read the mahabharata carefully you see that drona parva the seventh parva in the mahabharata 18 parvas are there in the mahabharata the seventh parva in the mahabharata the second one in the uh, war sequence five yuddha parvas are in the war after bhishma parva the second yuddha parva is drona parva and drona parva very clearly tells us what an acharya should not be na acharya the word means aacharikkunna yaal somebody who does things somebody who does aacharikya means perform somebody who who does not preach somebody somebody who actually sets a model for his students that is aacharya and dronacharya was far from an acharya he was a bad preceptor a ba- bad guru somebody who is not at all a good example of a guru and acharya if you read it carefully you will see that because dronacharya never considered his pupils as human beings he was fueling unnecessary competition among them so that he thought they would rival and master in archery the rivalry in archery will ultimately result in mastery in archery you imagine a classroom i am a teacher i have been teaching for nearly 30 years now three decades and uh, suppose i start engendering unnecessary competition in class i secretly fuel up jealousy among my wards and i i think i believe that this is for the welfare of the students because if they compete like this they will excel if i believe in this kind of a pedagogical practice am i a good teacher definitely not isn't it so dronacharya was a person like that 
he was a bad teacher and he was doing all the wrong things throughout his life uh, at the end of towards the end of the drona parva vedavyasa presents a wonderful moment which is like an anagnorisis in a greek tragedy a n a g n o r i s i s anagnorisis anagnorisis means self knowledge realization in every tragic story there is a realization the tragic hero or the protagonist at some point in his life will realize that i was entirely wrong and all through my life i was committing blunders in shakespeare's macbeth the most beautiful anagnorisis actually in shakespeare comes in macbeth where macbeth who killed his king for becoming a king and then who started wading through rivers of blood to maintain his throne ultimately his wife lady macbeth commits suicide and he himself faces defeat and there's a famous soliloquy a uh, one man dialogue eganga pasha by macbeth which reveals his anagnorisis his self realization awakening which goes something like this tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death you know he's talking about his own past life when he looks back every day he sees himself as a fool now you know i had been a fool throughout my life every day i renewed my stupidity that's all like a poor player that struts and frets upon the stage and is heard no more life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing isn't it so he realizes that you make all these pranks the thieves in life create a lot of noise but ultimately your life is a void it doesn't mean anything so this realization gives birth to a wonderful tragedy but when we think about the lesson regarding life again what i started off with life has to be simple isn't it unnecessarily making it complex will definitely result in tragedy so you know the, the way in which the concept of the aesthetics of rapture i present before you is something like this when uh, absolutely unimaginably horrible things are happening around that is a suitable substance for art a suitable substance for art Now some of the recent malayalam movies uh, after this ott kind of uh, telecast or whatever it is started uh, i have watched a few movies like arkariya or uh, nayat you if you have watched those movies you think about those situations or even home extremely acclaimed movie or kane kane recent ones actually you can see that there is an element of crying or the repression of a crying or something relating to human failure you know human failure shelly in his to a skylark it is an ode geetha a romantic ode shelly made beautiful statements like this our sweetest songs are those that tell of the saddest thoughts our sweetest songs are those that tell of the saddest thought so our sincerest laughter with some pain is fraught fraught means loaded laden so when there is a reason for extreme grief in real life it can become substance for art so art becomes powerful because of these kinds of ruptures in the flow of life had life been always flowing smoothly without aggression without violence of any kind including the sexual ones without uh, persons or groups imposing dominance over others without extremely heinous historical incidents like colonialism imperialism 
first world war second world war definitely you would not have got good art isn't it there's a very famous english poet i think it's a she poet the poetess i mean this the word poetess is not very common a woman poet a poet why should we refer to a poet as a man or a woman a poet is a poet poet means maker the meaning of the greek word poet is maker you don't have to mention the gender of a poet whether he or she is a poet a maker so ruth padder the name is ruth padder p a d e and she tells us bad politics makes good art bad politics makes good art you think about this the holocaust that is the single incident that gave birth to the greatest number of powerful movies and novels and poems the emergency period in india there are plenty of works on the emergency period in india from 1975 to 1977 i am not going to the historical aspects but plenty of books including salman of these midnight children or uh, rich like us by nayantara sega rich like us nayantara sega is the niece of jawarla nehru vijayalakshmi pandit's daughter indira gandhi's niece but she was a staunch opponent of indira gandhi and she wrote two works violently speaking against the emergency period one is a novel rich like us and the second one is a kind of political document from fear set free that is after the declaration of uh, the end of the emergency from fear set free actually when i was a student during my pg days the first seminar i conducted in my class was on rich like us it just happened to be so uh, our teacher of indian writing in english asked us to go to the library find a good work in indian writing in english and do a seminar on that i went to the library searched the indian writing in english uh, section i got the novel rich like us by nayantara sega i did not know anything about nayantara sega but i read the novel i did a seminar and that seminar was extremely well appreciated by my teacher professor meenakshi mukherjee she is no more she came to my house some years back she was a very good teacher she loved me a lot so one day she came to she visited my house but after a few years years she died uh, so she appreciated my seminar presentation i was just a pg student in my early days of post med studies but that day when i got the appreciation i took a very firm decision that was to marry imagine it that i decided that i would marry and i knew that my first born would be a daughter and i wanted to name that daughter nayantara which i did happily so my daughter's name is nayantara my eldest daughter's name is nayantara many people asked me and her actually is your name the film star's name the film star came when my daughter was 9 years old and it is not the film star's name the film star's name is actually diana that nayantara is a name that she uh, adopted for the film world and that's a personal anecdote but what i'm telling you is the concept bad politics makes good art this is what ruth, ruth padel says so the emergency period gave birth to even dharma purana by o v vijayan the saga of dharma puri in english that is a fierce allegory on the evils of the emergency if you have ever read dharma purana properly you will find it difficult when you when you start taking your meals certain images depicted in the novel will come to your mind and you feel a kind of nausea manam perut okkana you would be in heat that is if you understand the novel properly otherwise no problem so uh, it is such a novel such a powerful allegory but that allegory came into existence because there was bad politics is it right the emergency was a rupture in indian democracy in a way whether it was politically required or not that political people may make discussions 
for people dealing with literature, arts, humanities, definitely the emergency was unnecessary. No doubt. It was a kind of curtailing of human freedom, freedom of expression and all other kinds of freedoms. A human being must be a free being. There should not be restrictions on a person's self-expression, on a person's expression of whatever he or, he or she sees around. But the emergency was not like that. Fear censoring was there. People lived in fear. That's why Naitara Segal wrote after the emergency, from fear set free. So this is a liberation from fear. Is it a good thing to live in fear? Think about it. No, we are all happy because we are living in a democratic country. Democracy is what is required in everything, in human relations. Hierarchy is a is an unnecessary construct, remember. Whether it is a hierarchy within the family, outside the family. I was listening to the TV debates, even just before uh, coming to this from 12.30 to 1, I was uh, watching a program on television on the same incident that happened in my college. On male aggression on the female. And uh, where the, the program was conducted by Shani Prabhat. Prayadavai. Now, I was watching all these programs. Whenever I got a time after this, I was watching because I know plenty of discussions will be made and after some time people will forget this. But you must listen to it. People say what is required is wheat the curriculum. Wheat the curriculum. Instead of all the curricula uh, at university level and everything, we require a curriculum for the home where democracy is taught. Democracy. Yesterday, when we went to the funeral, I had the head of the department of Malayalam with me, of our college. We went together for the funeral. And uh, I told him, actually what is required is aesthetic distance. In everything, every human relationship, in every human endeavor, something called aesthetic distance is required. It's not aesthetic rapture, it's aesthetic distance. What is aesthetic distance? It's a major concept in uh, the appreciation of literature and arts. Now, if you look at a painting, you require a kind of distance. Now, suppose uh, you're watching a movie from a very close angle. You won't be able to appreciate the movie. When I was young, uh, and when we did not have enough money, we used to take uh, tickets for the front rows. And suppose you get your seat on a corner of the front row. Then the entire picture is too close to you and it appears like distorted. If a car is coming to you, if the car comes with one side of the car towards your eye, because you're sitting at close quarters, what do you call Tara ticket? The word Tara ticket is not a simple concept. In Shakespeare's time, there were people called groundlings. Groundlings, people who sat close to the stage. The, the common people, but they were the people who appreciated the, uh, the slangs. Shakespeare has incorporated a lot of sexual double meanings and double entendre, quibble, pun. Plenty of what you call a sleel, isn't it? Shakespeare is filled with that. There's a book by Eric Patridge called Shakespeare's Body, B-A-W-T-Y. Body means vulgar language. Shakespeare is a master of that. But that had a literary relevance and there were people to appreciate that, the ground legs. But a person sitting in a theater in Kerala in the front row and in the corner, the person with the Tara ticket, actually there is no Tara there. In my young days in local talkies, even Tara was there. There was a small theater in uh, my place, near my place, Udo, called Rani Talkies, where there were some seats in the back. It was a thatched kind of uh, coconut leaf thatched theater. And some seats were there, some chairs with uh, plenty of bugs to bed bugs to bite you, mota. And some benches were there. And in front of the benches, pure mud was there. People for 25 paise per ticket, they used to sit on the mud and watch. That is Tara ticket. So when you sit there, you don't get aesthetic distance. You're sitting too close to it. The visual effect is 
mark spoiled by that but if you watch a painting from a close quarters again you can't see the composition of the painting properly so you require some kind of optimum distance if you move too back then the things won't be clearly discernible so that distance is called aesthetic distance and objectivity is required for this but that aesthetic distance should be there in human relations also now you say one person's freedom ends with the tip of the other person's nose isn't it you don't have freedom beyond that so man or woman every person has got personal spaces into which you don't have the right to encroach or interfere or infiltrate trespass the moment you trespass into somebody else's territory you become a criminal the name of the greatest novel ever written is crime and punishment by common agreement many people in different theoretical texts including italo calvino have called crime and punishment kutum shikshay by fido dostoevsky the greatest novel ever written there could be debate regarding this because the the title i gave is the greatest novel some other people could say this is not the greatest and the one is there but many people say this is the greatest novel actually the russian title of crime and punishment the word for crime is prestiplenie it does not mean crime in english the translation the initial translations came out as crime and punishment so it it stuck on that's all but the real russian title if you translate it verbatim literally into english it means overstepping crossing the borders crossing the borders so when one person crosses the borders into another person's territory that becomes aggression that becomes violence that becomes a breaching of democratic freedom so i i was referring to this concept of aesthetic distance that is required in all democratic relationships and all relationships should be democratic whether within the family or outside so when i was talking about this during a journey back from uh, the funeral place my colleague the malayalam hod he said i would prefer to call it sneha dura in malayalam sneha dura you know sneha dura is not a good translation of aesthetic distance not a good translation if you think about the semantics of that if you think about meaning then sneha dura is not aesthetic distance but i immediately congratulated him for translating it like that i told him wonderful translation because even though it's not a literal translation it suggests the entire meaning of the concept of aesthetic distance so there should be a distance in human relationships which will maintain love the moment the relationship becomes too close or too distant the sneha dhuram is broken and the relationship gets strained paving the way for violence or any other kind of unimaginable thing so this is what actually happens but what i am telling you is when we are dealing with art the thing is that this breach in sneha dhuram this is what gives you good art that is the irony of that when there's a possibility of good art good artists always uh, catch up on this opportunity wherever they see a breach in this kind of uh, territorial boundary and whenever this territory is broken there is a crime there is violence there is akram and there is a possibility of art so the thing is that even in comedies i am i was generally talking about uh, tragic kind of presentations but even in comedy comedy is produced out of certain uncommon situations comedy is often created by uh, making fun of the other person body shaming or seeing somebody's you know, slapstick comedy scene somebody falling 
in old films uh, i think there's a there's an old film in which in which prem nasir was the uh, main actor temmadi velappa is a black and white film and when i was child and in this temmadi velappa this person gets different names at different points temmadi velappa is made to four on a banana peel palatholi iyal thenni veeruna ayittu oru palatholi ittu veedikkunnu and he got the name palatholi velappa and people laugh isn't it so uh, you create laughter out of things which are not very happy for the person who is experiencing sometimes uh, you know body shaming is one of the most important uh, organs of comedy nowadays some people are slowly getting an awareness regarding the indecency of creating comedies out of all these things but that is how it happens so wherever there is a rupture in the ordinary flow of life it could be linguistic because when you are using uh, what whatever i said earlier double entendre words with double meanings that is a situation where the usual flow of life is broken as a rupture and there is a possibility of aesthetics out of that so uh, this is what i wanted to tell you if i keep on speaking i could go on like this but i think the time limit is still 3:30 so there should be some time for people if someone wants to respond to it yeah definitely sir definitely so we'll post the questions okay yeah. if if questions should be asked not type uh, yeah definitely uh, we will read out the questions if they have any okay yes if there are there are they can either ask directly or i will read it out to you sir yeah sure Uh, sir uh, sir this is anaga um sir uh, i want to uh, sir uh, really it was a thankful uh, very thankful uh, it was a very valuable class for us um uh, sir i uh, sir this feminine art uh, it uh, which was uh, which led to this victimization of the woman in the early the early stages uh, but how did it pave way to the feminine movement for liberation at these days uh, actually this question is very good because that in a way has captured the gist of what i said i did not use any theoretical term because you know this is just a, a kind of uh, lecture meant to be on a general scale so i did not go into theoretical terms relating to feminism or any other kind of movements but definitely these movements are very strong nowadays uh, awareness regarding these things that there is a democratic space a room of one's own this is the work by virginia woolf virginia woolf is one of the first major feminist writers i'm teaching virginia woolf in class both theoretically and uh, in terms of novels so a room of one so a room in space every person requires a secure personal space and you know in malayalam we make a cliche like a standard of tanja idam that's the word so you you require your basic subjectivity your self could acknowledged there should be a proper acknowledging of the other whether it's a female or not actually uh, there is something tomorrow i am going to uh, already the education minister has talked about giving counseling to students and in my pg class there is only one boy and 29 girls so uh, i am going to give counseling in different capacities uh, on the same thing that the space must be maintained no person has got any right to encroach upon another person's territory be it physical mental emotional you know territories are ours and those territories have to be honored an honoring of territory you can say so your emotional territory definitely is there you have the freedom to uh, accept a person or reject a person you can be friends with a person you can be neutral with a person you can keep aloof from a person 
that is your personal prediction so uh, these kinds of awarenesses they it is very slow to come that is the tragedy of it because feminism has gone through different waves first wave second wave third wave and now we are talking about post feminism when your people are talking about whatever happened after the advent of feminism so post feminism are there different movements relating to post feminism more the period after feminism actually we are in post feminism but after all these theoretical movements the state of affairs is quite sorry because the theoretical notions have not come into practice what do you call praxis p r a x i s siddhanto prayogo theory and praxis on the praxis front things are still very bad so it gives plenty of opportunities for creating artworks based on the persecution of women eternal victimization of the feminine i said of the female it is there plenty of films are still made plenty of novels are still being written but when it comes to practical life what kind of success has actually been achieved is a very dubious question i am very doubtful that uh, these kinds of theorizations uh, have have in met with any kind of success that is the real situation but i don't know that i have successfully answered your question but the thing is that theory remains theory and life remains life it's very different okay. thank you sir Uh, dear uh, uh, Subhi sir, I am a faculty yes. member in uh, not in English but uh, in a commerce department. I am listening to uh, listening you for the last uh, Say couple your of name. minutes. So uh, I am fully agree with your uh, exploration regarding philosophy and poetry. But uh, uh, nowadays, uh, you as you pointed out. Philosoph- without a philosophy uh, there are so many so called poets so the saga of tarmuviri actually you cited uh, is an excellent example regarding the philosophy of poet philosophy of literature like everywhere even i uh, i feel that uh, uh, even in phd there is no ph <laughs> there is no ph <laughs> that means only quantitative things and uh, other uh, graphics uh, anybody get uh, uh, the phd but uh, right. the original original word is uh, the philo- doctor of philosophy that is why yeah. i am making a sarcastic comment like this so even in mars uh, is a social scientist and a scientist in revolution but mars uh, thesis actually based on philosophy the epicurean philosophy he portrayed uh, in his thesis in the university of jena <laughs> regarding yeah. regarding the greek philosophy I think it is kind of uh, emptiness in the field of uh, literature and everywhere without philosophy, without uh, considering philosophy as a parent science, parent uh, discipline. Uh, this kind of emptiness uh, feel everywhere, even in science, even in social science, uh, like uh, human humanities that you have cited, is absolutely true, sir. Yeah. even mahatma gandhi was a philosopher it was gandhi jayanti and i was reading a lot about gandhi he is a philosopher ah yeah yes yes good so thank you for your uh, uh, new kind of uh, presentation uh, keeping the originals of uh, literature and the uh, the rhythm of life thank you I am near, uh, I am a neighbor of Sir uh, Sir. Yes, yes sir. Okay, what's your name? Uh, Matthew Manuel. Matthew Manuel sir. Okay. Actually that may be the reason that, uh, that the point is that uh, now English has become an interdisciplinary subject. Definitely. Uh, Actually, yes. I, uh, I did not have time to talk about yes. this. Actually yes. I Uh, that should be addressed because uh, when i was a ug student we had only text from english literature yes 
okay english nothing outside but now you deal with a whole lot of things literature yes. is a minor component yes. and you are dealing with so many other things outside yes. literature yes. and that is that is mandatory otherwise yes. uh, you know without realizing what you are doing literature has to be having a bearing on life you yes. can't deal with the aesthetics now when you listen to the aesthetics the word that immediately comes to your mind is that you are talking about some very beautiful thing yes. actually you are not at all dealing with a beautiful thing that's the reality of it yes. so you have, you have to understand that life is not that beautiful there is a film called life is beautiful uh, does anyone know that by uh, yes. benigni there is a malayalam film in which mohanlal and sangeetha varma acted life is beautiful but there is a film uh, by benigni benigni's life is beautiful that is on the holocaust and if you watch that film it, it is like a harrowing experience for me the, the, the way in which that film goes so that is aesthetics don't think that aesthetics is something yes. beautiful yes yes and now literature has become an amalgamation of many subject areas definitely yes yes we can't deal with uh, literature per se we are dealing with so many other things yes is there any student i mean any question yeah, from the part of any student Uh, sir, uh, okay, please call. Uh, sir, uh, this is uh, Anaga uh, once again. Uh, sir, I have a question that uh, uh, I see many people uh, say that uh, they are influenced, they are motivated by art. That's why they took literature or uh, any other subjects in art. So, what we precisely mean by getting influenced and getting motivated by art? Actually, I I mentioned it uh, as I. when to motivation in in the sense means you know you 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 become influenced by the ideas of art you start reading art for knowledge uh, as uh, matthew sir matthew my sir said it is philosophy philosophy means philosophy love of knowledge philosophy is love of knowledge so for love of knowledge you start reading literature that is perfect but the question is whether it should motivate you to doing something when it comes to that aesthetics particularly indian aesthetics will tell you art should never motivate you to action Now suppose you watch a bank robbery and you become a robber and when you are caught you tell the policeman that i became a robber because i watched the robbery films films on robbery that is motivation to action or uh, seeing somebody committing suicide now there was a spurt of suicide in germany after the publication of sorrows of young werther i don't know whether you have heard about this in psychology it is called the werther effect w e r t h e r uh, the great german poet goethe published sorrows of young werther sorrows of young werther is on a character who uh ultimately commits suicide it's a kind of romanticization of suicide you can say sentimentalization romanticization of suicide and after this novel was published uh, not novel after this uh, poem long text it was published plenty of people committed suicide and this is called werther effect a uh, literary work leading people to ending their lives motivating them to action that is absolutely wrong such a thing should never happen in art that is what indian aesthetics tells us the basic philosophy behind the indian uh, world of knowledge is that art is for awareness art is not for action i don't know whether i am amply clear but uh, this is how it is presented it should never lead you to any kind of action yes sir it's clear thank you sir so that, those are all the questions that was a wonderful session sir thank you so much due to time constraints we are winding up the session let's mark the end of the formal function with appreciation and gratitude to all those who made this event a grand success now i invite mr chana ibrahim of third year b english to propose a vote of thanks
really a proud privilege to provide knowledge the souls responsible for the success of today's webinar. First of all, let me take the Reverend Father Joshi Chiranguri CMI, an esteemed individual of lovely manners and optimistic way of life. On behalf of the Department of English, I thank him from the bottom of my heart. Dr. C.B. James, the Honorable Speaker of the Day, has taken us to a world of various intricate aspects of the topic, the aesthetics of rupture reading literature. Through his spontaneous articulation, lively presentation, and in-depth approach, he has made this webinar so worthwhile and interesting. Thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful presentation. Mr. Sijo Joseph Chenili, the dynamic HOD of the English department, is a pillar and pride. The English department has reached enviable heights under his inspiring leadership. I express my sincere gratitude to you, sir, for being here. Thank you, sir. I also thank the brains and hands behind this workshop. Mr. Sushil George Joseph, Dr. Anu Anthony, and Mrs. Sheena Susan Baby. Organizing this program in such a splendid and stellar manner deserves an applause. I also take this opportunity to thank Roji sir for their technical support. Last but not the least, I express my heartfelt gratitude to the students of the English Department of KCMT for their wholehearted support. I also thank all the participants for your valuable presence during these uncertain times. Thanking all of you once again, let me conclude. Thank you, Ritsa. We have come to the end of the webinar. Once again, reminding you that the link to the feedback form is given in the chat box. Kindly fill up the form and submit it. Thank you. So, sir, thank you so much. It has been an amazing section, okay? Thanks. Enjoyed it thoroughly, yes. Enjoyed it thoroughly, definitely.